Pro Group Management. Workers' comp that works for you. Welcome to Nevada Newsmakers. Uh, we are pleased to host uh, the debate between uh, the Republican candidates for United States Senate. Uh, we have former Attorney General Adam Laxalt, who served in Iraq. Captain Sam Brown, who's retired and served in Afghanistan. Pleasure to have you both here. And uh, we're excited for being the hosts of this debate. Starting with you, Adam, we tossed coins to decide the seating and who got to ask the, uh, uh, get asked the first question. So starting with you, um, as you both are two former military men, this weekend, President Biden met virtually with members of the G7 and President Zelensky of Ukraine. The United States is supplying billions of dollars of weaponry and, according to published sources, gave the intelligence that resulted in the death of 12 Russian generals and sang the Moskva, Russia's flagship Black Sea missile cruiser. In your opinion, are we doing too much, too little, or not enough to help the Ukrainians? Thank you, Sam, for hosting this debate. Um, look, it's, it's incredibly important that we go back to the genesis of all this. Under President Trump, uh, we had a true peace through strength foreign policy, and we had no invasions from dictators like Vladimir Putin. And where this really started going awry was in the Afghanistan withdrawal, when President Biden had such a disgraceful exit from uh, that, that long war. And as a result, it showed weakness to our, our foreign adversaries, and it made, uh, it created the environment for people like Putin to move in. When we went the other direction on the Russian pipeline and uh, helped support getting rid of the sanctions, uh, this allowed the Russians to now have an actual monetary source to fuel an invasion. And so we can't move past that. Uh, we need to remind voters in 2022, this is the liberal foreign policy in action. They were scared that moving early, giving Ukraine weapons early, giving them planes far, far earlier would be something that would incite an attack, and instead it would have deterred an attack. As far as now, um, they've still been slow. They need to continue to supply as, many, as, many, uh, uh, as much equipment as possible to make sure that the Ukrainians can defend themselves. Uh, Captain Brown? Yeah, the, uh, the issue here is really not um, whether or not this is too much or too little. It's the way in which we are actually conducting our aid. And I would say at this point in time, um, I have been in favor of uh, supplying things like javelins uh, for anti-armor, um, stingers for anti-aircraft. Uh, what I do not think we should do is send any troops. Another concern I have, though, is that when we all know that Ukraine has been a place where there has been a lot of corruption in the past, anytime we're talking about sending a lot of just monetary aid, that is something we should all be concerned about. Uh, another major concern I have and something I think the Senate ought to look into is why are we forecasting or, or revealing the type of sort of, uh, you know, behind the scenes aid that we are providing to Ukraine. We should not be using our intelligence services and then, and then broadcasting that to Russia um, at this point in time. That is, that is ill-advised and something I think the Biden administration is doing because it is one of the few things that Americans think that, uh, that he is handling in somewhat of a positive light. I do want to rebut that. Um, okay, then I'd like to follow up. Um, do you believe, uh, Adam, that this is the beginning of World War III if President Putin uses nuclear or chemical weapons to save face? This is certainly the danger of the situation we're in right now and why it's important that the U.S. does not put troops on the ground. Uh, as, as someone that served in Iraq, uh, I believe that between the two wars, people have a lot of war fatigue amongst our voters, and I think that's a bipartisan sentiment. Um, so we have to be incredibly careful that, that this, is, this is Western Europe's job to police this action. Uh, this should not be our job for us to be behind the scenes and giving aid as we have, have done uh, is certainly something we should do. But to get to, to be leaking intelligence secrets and to be uh, broadcasting these things uh, is dangerous. And, um, but if no question if Vladimir Putin used nuclear weapons, of course we would have to uh, respond. And that would create a very, very dangerous world. 
Captain Brown? Look, uh, that would that would be an unfathomable, uh, you know, decision by Vladimir Putin, and thing that something that would warrant response. Um, I would hope that if uh, America exhibits the sort of leadership that it should, uh, that that there would be only one global response, and that would be against uh, Russia. It would be unified. Um, but at the end of the day, the problem we have is the. America is losing its leadership position in the world, and, and that's something that we need to retain. Uh, I'd like to introduce at this point Victor Jakes. He is a columnist for the Las Vegas Review Journal, and he's co-moderating this debate with me. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Sam. And Sam, we'll start with you for this one, jumping back to domestic policy. Over the last several years, politicians ranging from Donald Trump to Bernie Sanders have called for the elimination of the filibuster. The Democrat in this race, race Senator Catherine Cortez Masto, says she wants a return to the talking filibuster, which would essentially gut the minority party's ability to block legislation. Do you support any changes to the filibuster, and if so, what changes? You know, the, the filibuster has been a, a hallmark of um, you know, the legislative process in the Senate, and I think it's something that protects uh, the minority's voice. Um, and at this time where we have such radical swings, um, you know, from from you know, the left uh, moving further and further left, that uh, even if Republicans are the minority, uh, we ought to be able to protect that voice. And in, in the event that uh, Republicans have an overwhelming uh, victory, um, that the filibuster ought to stay in place even for a minority Democrat. Thank you. Adam? Thank you, Victor. Um, look, our, our, our federal government was intended to be limited. And the filibuster is a huge piece of that. The last thing we want is for one party to be able to ram a radical agenda down the throats of Americans. And we know Senator Reid, um, you know, partially lifted the filibuster, which created the, the, the judge situation that the Democrats uh, still bemoan. Um, and so hopefully they learn their lesson. The filibuster's been something that has uh, stabilized our democracy and uh, in, in, in many ways limited the radical lurches. But we are seeing the most radical lurch we've ever seen from a party in history under the Biden administration in the last year and a half. This is from a president that promised he was gonna be a centrist and a moderate and heal the country. He's been a far left politician and uh, where would we be without Joe Manchin holding the line without a filibuster as well to hold the line Senator Masto has stuck with the Democrats the entire time. She has never broken from her party. Um, Nevada needs someone that is willing to stand with them and isn't going to be a consistent vote for the radical left. Okay, um, let's move on. Um, and I should refer to you as Attorney General, not just Adam. Um, with Adam's the fine. With the uproar over the Supreme Court leak re regarding Roe versus Wade, some are concerned that with this Supreme Court, same-sex marriage could be in jeopardy too. Your thoughts? Look, I think that um, since I got in this race in September, uh, I've never seen the voters so upset with the status quo. The President Biden tried to run on this centrist campaign. He promised to bring Americans together. And from day one, he's governed and he's spoken as a hard leftist. And it's made our country more divided it has hurt our economy. It has driven gas prices up. It has made us less safe. It has made the border wide open. And so um, these are the things that voters care about right now. These are the things, the reasons why we're living in potentially a red tsunami change election. And so the Democrats are going to do whatever they can to change the subject to things they think are more favorable for them. Uh, but the reality is there is no escaping the agenda and the, the policies of the Biden administration that, again, Senator Catherine Cortez Masto has been a consistent, reliable vote for. Okay, but, but to go back to my original question, uh, same-sex ma marriage could be in jeopardy. Um, do you agree? I, I, I think that that's a, a pretty wild hypothetical. I think that, uh, you know, we need to see what happens with this leaked published opinion. But as I said, Sam, the Democrats are going to start spinning all sorts of tales of woe, and they're going to go completely overboard and say that all of past presidents, precedents and all the Supreme Court history are all going to be overturned now. Uh, I think that is wrong. 
Uh, I think this is what the Democrats do. They divide the populace, they demagogue issues, and here's the good news, though, is that people are onto that, and they're tired of it, and I think they're gonna tune it out. Okay, Captain Brown? You know, this is uh, an, an issue that I, I don't think that there's any chance is overturned, but the, the broader question is, why is government in the business of uh, marriage to begin with? And I think this is what um, Americans are tired of, is a government that wants to get further and further involved in people's lives. And we've seen that um, not just in, you know, who someone's partner or who they're married to, but in the way that businesses, um, you know, are limited or, um, you know, what, what, how, how uh, education is going. And we've got, you know, now um, schools that want to push indoctrination of children instead of education. And so that's, that's the broader concern is how do we limit government? And we need folks who will go to the Senate who will be part of that, um, you know, sort of uh, bulwark and, and, and bastion against an incursion into our personal lives. I do want to respond to that. Uh, Sam, just one more question on that, that leaked Roe opinion. If it, if it happens, if the Supreme Court overturns Roe, would you support any new federal restrictions on abortion? You know, that's a, that's a hypothetical uh, question and, and something that at the end of the day, an overturn of Roe would return power back to the states. Um, but uh, look, at the end of the day, I've been pro-life. I've always uh, been pro-life and my position of being pro-life um, really is, was fortified by my own personal experience of, of getting to the end of my life and actually giving up the will to live and, and then now having had the blessing of life to this point from then, knowing how much that I was able to, to give and to offer and to, and to participate in life. Life is something we should always uh, seek to protect. So there's kind of a divide in the pro-life community of if you know, abortion is a state's issue only or if there's a role for the federal government. So I'm just you know, curious where you kind of come down on that. Do you think it's something the Fed should get involved in in terms of putting in new abortion restrictions or should it be left simply to the states? Um, you know, this is something that as it currently stands would be left to the states. But once again, uh, I am pro-life. Um, and if there was any sort of uh, legislation to come forward, I would want to see that specific language. Um, Adam, uh, you get 30 seconds if you'd like to respond. I don't get the same question? Uh, you oh. know, you have exactly the same question. Oh. So, yeah, the question would be, you know, is abortion, if Roe's overturned, a federal or a state issue in your view? Yeah, um, let, let, let me first just say why I'm pro-life. My, my mother had me out of wedlock in the 1970s, and she was in her early 20s, no college degree. She got a tremendous amount of pressure to not bring me into this world and uh, fortunately she made the decision to bring me here and so uh, I'm, I'm always going to believe her that I hope people are going to have a chance to live like I have. Um, as, as far as you know the future of Roe, uh, it, is, it is quite clear that Roe v. Wade was invented by the Supreme Court. Scholars have known that forever, that's been taught in law school uh, since I went to law school a few decades ago. Um, and it was always better left return to the states. It's because it was put at the federal level that it made it such a divisive, uh, highly charged issue. And I think it's better left to the states. Okay, Victor, you get the next question. Absolutely. Uh, Adam, inflation is at a level not seen in four decades. What caused inflation? And what would you do if elected to lower inflation, knowing that Joe Biden is going to be president for at least the next two years? Yeah, there's no question this is the number one issue for voters right now. Uh, Nevadans are struggling. Gas is at all-time highs. Inflation uh, is at all-time highs. And this is because of massive spending. Washington has a spending problem. It's, it's probably long had a, definitely long had a spending problem. But in the last few years, uh, we've seen trillions of dollars come down the pipe. But what is usually left off the equation is COVID. And the Democrats uh, decided to go the shutdown route. Many warned that you're not going to be able to flip the economy back on and suddenly everything would be okay. Uh, those warnings were ignored. And here we are. It is because of the supply chain and all the troubles that it's created that we also have this high inflation. So we must never go back to lockdowns. We need to have a president that would actually go to work on fixing the supply chain. And we need to stop spending money. 
Okay, and I just want to point out that the lockdown started under President Trump and continued into the Biden administration, uh, but was done on a governor by governor basis. So some states were locked down, others were not. Correct. Uh, but, you know, the decision was made at the front end uh, that that was perhaps the solution. I, I don't agree that that was the correct solution. Um, but Governor Ron DeSantis, uh, as early as May, uh, knew that this was not the direction. He took Florida in a different route, which Florida's economy is booming and is far better than Nevada's and it's a tourist based economy and they showed the different paths. Schools were open, kids were in camps, they didn't lose all that education. And so the, the path we took as a state that Senator Masto, you know, marched right along with Governor Sisolak uh, was a terrible path. Uh, it set our state back and I think it's going to be very, very hard to recover from. Okay, so Roe versus Wade is a state's issue but lockdowns should be a federal issue. Is that what you're saying? No, I, I'm, I'm saying that the, the states absolutely were in charge of deciding what they're gonna do with COVID. I Correct. think Governor Sisolak made a terrible choice uh, and he should not have had this state locked down as long as he did. And my point of bringing up Senator Masto is that she's the senior senator, senior elected in the state. Our people were hurting. Hispanic small businesses were being shut at all time highs. Parents uh, were losing all that education, especially single moms. They couldn't, they couldn't work and have their kids at home. And if she was a champion for Nevada, she would have broken from the Newsom Sisolak shutdowns and said, this is not the path for our state. I would have been on the other direction if I was a senator of Nevada. Um, Captain Brown, you have a lot of time to be able to respond. You know, your original question was about inflation and uh, without a doubt, um, the, the blame falls on career politicians. And you know, just as a reminder, uh, most of the folks who are in D.C. don't come from a shared background with everyday Nevadans or everyday Americans. Uh, most of them uh, grew up, uh, you know, became lawyers and went to D.C. and they are out of touch with what we face in our lives. Did you know that 80% of every dollar in circulation today was invented in the last two years? It is congressional spending that is driving inflation. It doesn't help that we also have a Fed that is a become a partisan tool of the administration. Mm -hmm. That as they ought to be raising interest rates at a much more aggressive level to combat inflation, they're, they're talking about, well, maybe we do a half point here, uh, half point there. No, the answer is when we have a runway inflation that is the highest it's been in over 40 years, that they should be raising rates at two and a half points or more immediately to try and combat that. Look, it is everyday Nevadans that are suffering the, the higher cost at the pump, uh, cost in the, at the grocery store, um, you know, child care costs are going up. It's, it's hurting us at home. And, and DC and the political uh, career politicians there are, are detached from that reality. And, and it falls squarely on their shoulders uh, to blame for this inflation situation. Okay, but if you were to see the Fed raise interest rates in one shot at two and a half percent, uh, two and a half points, uh, would you not immediately plunge the, uh, the country into a, a deep recession? Sam, you and I have talked about this before. It's, I'm not saying it's gonna be pretty or easy, but I'm talking about what we need to do is ensure that we're, we're doing the right thing, even if it does cause temporary pain. The damage that they're doing by this, this runaway spending is, is going to have a longer negative impact on our country than if we take the appropriate economic ste steps of raising <coughs> interest rates. And, and so at the end of the day, we have career politicians who are afraid of doing the right thing, and maybe they don't even know what the right thing is to do, but uh, that's no excuse, and, and we need to do uh, what is in the best interest of Americans and Nevadans, even if it causes temporary pain. Okay, um, Adam, would you like to respond to that? Uh, two and a half points sure, I, increase? I, well, I, I would like to say what I think really needs to be done, which is a huge piece of where we are today is the Biden agenda of the radical Green New Deal. They pledged that they were gonna kill fossil fuels day one, and he signed a bunch of executive orders day one. And this started what happened with our energy, which is a huge piece of our economy. 
especially in light of Ukraine and giving the Russians all of this power uh, financially in this, in this terrible war, he should wake up tomorrow and finally reverse course. He needs to get us back to President Trump, America first, energy independence. It worked. We were a net exporter. Fuel was at all time lows. And this was all part of the economy booming, wages being at all time highs, and inflation being at consistent solid levels. And so we need to stop spending. We need to get back to energy independence. Uh, that combination will start taking us back in the right direction. Do you want to respond to Yeah, energy independence certainly has a lot to do with it. And, and it's something that sadly, um, not only did we give up in this administration, but we've moved further away from. Um, and, you know, just I want to go back and, and hit one of the things that Adam mentioned earlier, which is supply chain issues. Um, the problem is too many people who are in office think that they and the government can be part of that solution. The fact of the matter is it's, it is the private sector, it is the market that actually knows what's best. And so when we have politicians that say, well, hey, I can fix the supply chain issues, like, no get out of here. You can't fix it. In fact, you've been a part of creating that problem. But, you know, be, as a result of supply chain issues, everything is in short supply, <laughs> in, including backbones in D.C. Um, Adam, you want to respond to that? Uh, by fixing the supply chain, I mean they need to go to work on lifting the government regulations and all the inhibitors of the private sector being able to take off. Uh, if you look at, uh, for example, fracking and the shale revolution, uh, they need they need government relief to be able to get going again. And so that is something that the president should be doing. And by the way, Senator Masto, uh, look at our state. We're number two, sometimes number three, in gas. We're competing with Hawaii and California. Never before have we competed with those two states in gas prices. And she continues to stand with the administration on these issues. We need a senator who's willing to break from the administration and stand with ordinary Nevadans. Do you have a response to that? Yeah, on, on the gas, it's, it's important to note that uh, we don't have higher prices here just as a result of, you know, less pumping here domestically. Uh, California, you know, the, the pipelines that feed us for our, our fuel here go through California, and they've got their own special, you know, environmental standards for their fuel that on a supp supply-demand basis creates higher cost. So we're really held hostage here in Nevada to, to getting fuel that is uh, created on a mixture that is unique to California. And California shouldn't be able to just sort of unilaterally create this, this standard that imposes a higher cost to others. So I guess I'll, I'll ask kind of, you both have hinted at DC spending and, and what that looks like. And I think we're, I think we're on Sam for you starting first, but what are some concrete ways that you can uh, reduce spending in DC or that you would support reducing spending? Yeah, so uh, this is this is one of those fun ones that uh, you know you hear people mention but there's seldom any good follow-through. Uh, one of the things that I've been proposing is that anywhere that we have a duplication of a department or agency at a federal level that also has a state counterpart that we don't need that duplication. And so, so I have a two-fold plan here. Is one is start reducing the, the uh, allocation of money to those federal departments and agencies, and that will start cutting down our federal budget. And it also returns more control and power back to the states, where we already have, for example, you know, a Department of Transportation, a Department of Education, a Department of Energy, environmental uh, departments or agencies. And, and so at the end of the day, we reduce federal spending, but we also return more power back to the states. Anything you'd want to do with Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid? Look, a lot, a lot of that is mandatory uh, spending right now. Um, and so we, we can start with uh, what I just described. Adam, what about you? What are some ways to reduce spending? Well, let me first just say that when I was Attorney General, uh, we got more out of that office than any previous Attorney General. In fact, we inherited a lot of problems from, from uh, then our former Attorney General Masto, uh, but I still return taxpayer dollars uh, every, every biennium as Attorney General. And so I believe that we need to be better stewards of our money. Uh, I think that President Trump uh, started an anti-regulatory movement 
um, you know, the, the one in, one out. Uh, I think that that is important to restore the concept that uh, we need less regulations, not more regulations. That's something that will absolutely reduce the cost of government and most importantly, reduce the cost of the private sector. And I would just say that fraud, waste and abuse is absolutely a real thing. And we saw when the federal government showering trillions of dollars on the states, we saw an awful lot of COVID fraud in this state. Um, and you have to- For example. You have to multiply that. Well, there was a lot of misuse in the spending where people were, were um, you know, taking the benefits and they were not using them properly. There's tunes of you know, millions and millions of dollars. Um, and so I think that it's important that um, we really get a, a grip on the, the projects that government are doing, and we must try to reduce the role of government, and that, that, that's the best thing we can do, reduce so the, spending. the big drivers of the deficit are still Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Any, any changes there? Um, you know, I, I think that we need to look at some portability issues, and we need to look at for ways that people are going to be able to uh, transfer benefits and to find a way to drive down costs. Okay, and you get the last 30 seconds on this if you care to take it. Yeah, I mean, just back to other ways to cut spending would be zero-based uh, budgets where, you know, departments and agencies need to prove out why they need. Uh, we, you know, we have a chronic issue of of uh, you know, people spending all the way through the fiscal year to try and retain their budget and increase it. Um, so that'd be something else, and legislation by appropriation would be another way that we can try and rein in federal spending. Watch part two of our debate with Adam Laxalt and Sam Brown on our next program on Nevada Newsmakers. We'll see you then. As always, you can watch Nevada Newsmakers 24 hours a day at nevadanewsmakers.com. You can also check our archive going back to 2005 on our website, again, nevadanewsmakers.com. We'll see you on the next show. Early in the morning or throughout the night, professional truck drivers are on the job, serving you, safely moving freight that's crucial to our economy. From the oldest industries to our newest innovators, from the exotic to the everyday, trucks are everywhere, moving everything. Never afraid to embrace a future that makes Nevada and our nation stronger. Trucking moves America forward. Pro Group Management specializes in providing industries with the necessary components to satisfy and exceed workers' comp requirements. Every business has unique needs and specific regulations. Pro Group Management stays ahead of the curve, providing up-to-date services to keep your industry in top form. Discover how we simplify your tasks, improve efficiency, and reduce expense to keep you moving in a positive direction. Pro Group Management, workers' comp that works for you. Retail's impact on Nevada's economy? Enormous. 8,600 businesses, large and small, employing 145,000 workers. And last fiscal year, retail paid tax on nearly $60 billion in sales. We're the Retail Association of Nevada. We support retail, we help it grow, and we mean business. R-A-N-N-V dot org. Nevada Newsmakers Studio is located at the headquarters of the Nevada Trucking Association. Motion and purpose are a truck's greatest virtue.